welcome to Marvel Talk. I am Oled, and I'm joined by my co-host, Andre C. And our guest this week, Co- Cody Defoe. How's everybody doing today? I'm, I'm doing absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I, get to talk, I just finished talking wrestling with Mel for a show coming out later this week. And I get to talk Marvel with you guys. I'm excited. Awesome. And Cody, you're muted? Cody, you're, you're muted. Mute, you're muted. There he, there he goes. I'm just trying to be really quiet over here, okay? <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm doing better than I was earlier in the week. Feeling a little bit better. Excited to, to talk about this movie. I thought uh, uh, there's a lot to dive into and and get get off my chest here. I think. Yeah. Um. And and to do so, we're going to go ahead and start our non-spoiler section. And as such, Cody, why don't you go ahead and talk about your non-spoiler thoughts? about well, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. It was just... It was a lot. It, it was probably my favorite Marvel movie, probably in the last like three phases, I think. Um, just emotional, powerful, um, thought-provoking, just a really, really deep, heartfelt way to go about just rounding out the trilogy of this group of the Guardians. Andre? Cody said it, it, it. It's got so much heart. It's got heartbreak. It's got uh, like laughs. It's got every kind of emotion you want to feel from these characters. We have become so emotionally invested over two movies plus the Avengers movie. Like, we, we, I love these characters. And like, this was a comic that I never, I thought would ever come to be in a movie and when they announced it i'm like i'm interested because i read them but and then this was that perfect culmination in the way it, it it gives you all the story resolutions to all the characters in this and how everybody goes in their certain ways just a beautifully made movie and a, and a great swan song for arguably the best director arguably in marvel's cinematic history so far in the mcu and james gunn yeah i mean you could i i don't think it's much it's it's tough to say between you're deciding between james gunn and the russos right mm-hmm. when you're talking about marvel mcu directors you you're really stuck with the two of them you're yeah. either talking about the russos and the infinity war end game captain america civil war and uh uh winter soldier series that that series of four Mm-hmm. Or you're talking about James Gunn and the four Guardians movies plus the holiday special. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's very much dependent on what you look for and what you enjoy in a movie. I think there's a certain sect of the audience that would argue Taika Waititi should be in that conversation. I don't know that any of the three of us are, but I feel like he won over a lot of people with with his style too that enjoyed what he offered. I love Taika, but the problem with Taika is he's got one great movie and one of my least favorite Marvel movies in, in the entire MCU. Love and Thunder was such a disappointment coming off of Ragnarok that it's tough to, whereas the Russos are steady. None of their movies feel like they dip too much. And then the James Gunn, yes, Guardians 2 isn't as good as 1 and 3. I'll, I'll, my own personal opinion, mm-hmm. 1 and 3 are by far the best James Gunn movies. Mm-hmm. But and two will, is still an amazing movie. It's just it, it doesn't hit the heights of one and three. Yeah. I will say this for James Gunn. Throughout the course of this movie, knowing that this was kind of his his farewell, that he's moving on and moving into the DC universe, the one thing for me out of this was that it made me feel something for the future of DC. If James Gunn is behind that production for the future of the DC universe, maybe he can get to that point of a Kevin Feige for the DC universe to give us for those characters, what we've gotten for the Marvel characters. Yeah. And the guardians of volume three for me, my non-spoiler review is if there's an emotion you can feel, this movie makes you feel it. Whether it's rage at wanting to punch the screen which I did a couple times want to physically punch characters on screen. Whether it was rage at a character not being done well enough for my liking, considering how much... We'll we'll get into this one because uh, it's a point I want to make. I think Adam Warlock is a vastly underrated 
and mm. underutilized character in this entire thing. And he's done solely to do two things in the entire movie. And that's the entirety of what they needed him for. And I felt like coming off of the post credit scene from Guardians 2, he should have been more involved. Um, that being said, this movie is a masterpiece. It's in my top 10. And the top five that I have are movies that are lamppost Marvel movies that on a given day, any of them is one and any of them is five. So to break that is almost impossible. But this movie comes pretty damn close. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I think, well, go ahead, Cody. I think this movie on a rewatch and on future watch throughs has that possibility to live up to the standards of those same films mm -hmm. for me in the future. Um, yeah. something that I'll look back on and be able to watch this movie multiple times and just appreciate even more what it brought to the table. It's the first time since the end of Phase 3. And I'll say it, I'll even break it even further. It's the first time since Endgame that I've wanted to go back to the theater to see a Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. There has been no Marvel movie, with the exception of Shang-Chi, that has made me want to go back back to the movie theater as soon as I've seen the movie to see it again. That includes uh, No Way Home, uh, which is in my top 10, but it includes No Way Home of after No Way Home, I didn't really want to go see it again. I did. <laughs> I saw it. And like, I said, and, and like I said, that's, pers that, that's personal yeah. things. You know, all of us have our own personal taste. With that being said, I don't think there's a whole lot more we can talk about with this movie without going into some spoilers. So I'm just yeah. going to go ahead and throw the spoilers banner up. Oh, Andre's going to hit spoilers. his banner off the stream now. <laughs> yeah, Astrid has not seen this, so Astrid, please stop watching if you are watching, because I know you haven't seen this. Um, because if you were, you probably would have been in here. Um, that being said, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 came out on May 5th. Uh, we talked a little bit about James Gunn. Let's go ahead and talk first about... Let's start with these two characters. Star-Lord and Gamora. Okay. I want to go kind of character-based because this movie is a very character-driven movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best way to talk about this is to talk about some of these characters in what their arc was. Because for the first time in a long time, Every single character in this movie feels like they had an arc. Yeah. It's been, I, a, lo it's been a long yeah. time since we've had a movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe where I feel like everybody gets their own little section where they grow and they have a story in this movie. Yeah, I can see that. Because, like, and certain character stories were paired together with, with other ones. Like, Star-Lord was very based around Gamora. Like, it was his heartbreak in trying to reconcile his feelings of, of not having her anymore and him growing into accepting that. I love that how she reacted to him in it, that she was just like, no, I am not this person. Like, go for yourself. You may love somebody that existed for you, but you never existed for me. And, it, and it's just this heartbreak of having to see the person he loves. It, 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 it was heartbreaking to see him. And you can see him when he's drunk early on in the movie and yelling at Rocket for stealing his, his uh, Zoom. Like, oh, it was so heartbreaking to me. And you look at all that and you just, and it just his growth throughout and seeing him by the end of it, accepting that she isn't the same person anymore and that he needs to go back to the beginning to kind of fix who he is inside and fill that empty hole in another way is not being Gamora and Gamora finding a family, this version of Gamora finding a family in the Ravager. Mm -hmm. Cody, your thoughts on Star-Lord? Yeah, I, I mean, very much what Andre just said. I, I echo a lot of the same there that um, you know, we had the original version of these characters where you had Star-Lord as the lost with no family who had the Ravagers as his family and Gamora 
under Thanos's thumb, just trying to escape and find a way to make a difference for herself. And now it almost feels like they flipped roles in this one in a way that she, you know, got away from Thanos earlier in her life and ended up being um, brought in and, and taken in as a member by the Ravagers. And you've got Star Star Lord out here with the Guardians, where he feels like he needs to get out and get back what he lost or what he's what he needed. And, um, you know, Gamora lost her family and. Star Lord lost Gamora, and somehow they just did a complete 360 in who they are, and the way it was portrayed throughout of of him like trying to to just show her who he was again and have her find those feelings that the other Gamora had had. Um, and, and I did appreciate the way the whole thing was played out and the interactions between these two. They didn't really have much between them that didn't also include Nebula. And so the the ties that were there between Gamora and Nebula and Star Lord and Nebula, it just it really felt like it completed the story that she was she was that missing piece that kept them together too. Yeah. Um, for me, the whole thing can be summed up in Gamora's last words in the movie. I bet we were fun. It was such a moment where. She takes the whole movie, and most of these things you've seen in the ads, between the scene with the colors where Star-Lord's confessing his love, the scene in the elevator where they're kidnapping the poor girl at Orgocorp, and mm -hmm. he, he goes over the quick, you know, TLDR version of Gamora and uh, Star-Lord. All of that you've seen in the thing. Uh, her not understanding Groot and constantly being mad at just, I know you're Groot. All of that greatness. At the end of the movie, I think it almost goes unnoticed that Groot comes over and talks to her. And without missing a beat, she reacts like she understands him and just walks away. But she catches herself. Yep. And that's there, the part. There was, there was <laughs> yeah. two, right? Like he walks in and says something and she immediately starts responding before she catches that she understood him. And then she changes what she was saying to something else and then walks out. Yep, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then she and Peter are having their final goodbye, and they're back to back. Neither one can see each other, and you can see the emotion on her face. She started to understand their relationship, and all she says is, "I bet we were fun." Mm -hmm. The, the it, other thing here, I I think that we don't want to overlook either is, I feel like that might almost be a meta comment from James Gunn that he had a different story in mind for them mm -hmm. and had to pivot on their story because of the infinity stuff. Yeah. Very possible. But, yeah. I can see it. Cause again, he has written a story in guardians one guardians two. Yes. Leading into the uh, infinity war, but maybe he was plan wasn't the hat was maybe to have them right off into the sunset together. originally, being like, but having her die in Infinity War changes everything again. He was let go after that before before all that came. So he didn't. Maybe had he been in the fold when it was all being developed, I don't know. Had he been able to give his, but again, there was no way to get to that point in Infinity War without it. But mm -hmm. it's just that, yeah, you never know what could he have done. I will make it known, James Gunn did do a quick Q&A the other day on Twitter where he said there are two rules. It has to be Guardians related and it has to be a yes-no question. Like, he wasn't going to spoil anything, but he was going to answer yes-no questions. The question was asked to him directly, would there ever be a director's cut of the Guardians trilogy? And his exact response was, you have the director's cut. These three movies are my cut. That's... So, it's I, I agree that there could have been changes to his story in Guardians Three made because of Endgame, because of Infinity War. But at the end of the day, he is entirely happy with yeah. his story. This isn't a Zack Snyder thing where mm -hmm. Zack Snyder has hours of footage on the floor that he hates. Because he left the project to take care of personal business, and Josh Whedon came in and cut everything to pieces. Mm 
No, it wasn't so much in that way. I no, meant I it was more so before the script was written. Yep. If he had an idea and then he had to pivot because of where Feige and company wanted and needed the Infinity Saga to go. And if James Gunn wasn't in the loop knowing that Gamora was going to be sacrificed, yep. that he then had to find a way to rewrite a script that fit what he could do with this movie. No, I agree. I, like I said, I just think it's it's nice to know that at the end of the day, he's happy with the movies that he put out. Mm -hmm. And it's not something where he's like, no, I had something cut out from underneath me. He seems happy. And um, if you, oh, but, and watching those movies, I don't feel like anything is missing. Watching Justice League, I felt like so much was missing. That required a director's cut, in my opinion, because that movie was, mm. but this all wraps up so beautifully. You know, and the story, the way it's told, yeah, this is, it, it's just coming from a guy who told the story the way he wanted. We're gonna we're gonna move on to somebody who's gonna take a lot less time to talk about. Let's talk about Adam Warlock. <laughs> oh, I want to hear from you first, Ed, because you I'll already kind of foreshadowed <laughs> this. So Adam Warlock, we see the fight scene with Adam Warlock. It is relatively the first scene in the movie. Like it's the first five minutes is this fight scene with Adam Warlock fighting the Guardians on nowhere, and he's the one who delivers the blow to Rocket. That requires them to use the med pack that puts Rocket in the position he's in. Um, and then from then on, he seems like just a piece of the movie to keep things moving until the very end of the movie where they need him to save Star Lord at the very end. Because for some reason, he's the only one who can go get Star Lord after Groot tries and his limbs break off. And things like that. It just felt like the middle of the movie. And the the realization that the Sovereign isn't as powerful as we thought they were in Guardians 2. Makes them feel less important now rethinking about Guardians 2. Because of how downplayed the High Evolutionary plays them in this movie. Talking about them and having woken him too early. But it just felt like he was great in what he had to do. But it felt like of all the people in this movie, I was looking forward to a really great start to Adam Warlock. And it just seems like I got an appearance to set up whatever he does next. Yeah, go ahead, Cody. I get where you're coming from. It wasn't a, a lot. I definitely had high expectations just knowing the story and, and how powerful Adam Warlock is and that he really was in the comic version, the one that resolved the entire infinity gauntlet saga. But the, the key point to me was the sovereign mentioning that the high evolutionary pulled Adam from his cocoon too soon. So what we're seeing here is an Adam Warlock who has not reached his full potential, who has not understood his power and his abilities yet. He's still learning. He's still kind of under the thumb and the watchful eye of his mother. It's not until her story ends that he actually starts to think for himself and make decisions for himself and realize which side of the good and evil boundary line he falls on. I liked, I liked the end. I liked, you know, how, how it all came together and he ended up, you know, finding himself and finding his true calling at the end there. I definitely think there's a lot of story still to tell for Adam Warlock. I think if we do end up getting a sequel Eternals, that's a, a really strong place that I would like to see him end up. Uh, but I, I definitely don't think we're done with his story by any means. No, I, me either. I think we're, I think his story will evolve. I think we're going to get something to do with the guardians going forward. I don't think it'll be on this under the stewardship of James Gunn. But it'll be like it'll be the new Guardians, whatever it's going to be, whatever they want to, whatever they have. The, something's going to come from that because that post credit scene is going to play out in some way. We there's a character in there that has to play out in some way, in my opinion, and especially with Adam Warlock, because of how and I I very much like the fact that they said he was pulled out too early, so he doesn't have his universe, essential universe breaking powers yet still has to develop into those powers so it gives the character an arc I thought he was played for a bit of a goof 
in the middle with, with the weird animal thing, whatever blurp. it was. The blurp. blurp. The blurp. And it was just, I, w- I was a little disappointed by that. Because, again, I'm a big fan of Adam Warlock from the comics and what his origins are. But the guy, but then I look at the guy who plays him. He's always, the guy playing him, I should have been an indicator for me going into this movie. He's always played kind of a goof. And been in. So I really should have expected Adam Warlock to be a goof in this. I really should. And again, I don't want this to come off as like I was disappointed with his performance. I think Will Poulter did a very oh. good job with the, the role he was given. I'm just disappointed in my own. And this is the one thing I did to myself. It, it's, it's a self-done thing. You see the cocoon at the end of Guardians 2. You know who he is. And it just... I got my expectations too high on what to expect. He did very good for what he did. But he there were pieces of him being there that just felt like he had to be there to be in position to do what he needed to do. I feel like that opening scene, that fight scene, really kind of set the expectations, set the bar high. Because I feel like that opening scene probably was more of what we expected from Adam throughout the movie. I think what turned the corner for me on it was the scene with the Ravager that they took captive where they end up getting the blurb. And he (laughs) blasts him and burns him to smithereens instead of just torturing him. And it, it kind of opened my eyes and just made me accept the fact that this Adam is still very immature and doesn't understand what he's doing yet. And at that point, I just accepted that this is who he is for this movie and that the high evolutionary was more of the key focus. Hmm. We're going to keep moving on a little bit because I don't, I don't want to take too much time out of everybody's day. But I do want to talk about the other Guardians. As, now, I know Star-Lord's at the front of this. But let's talk about the Guardians as a whole, and more specifically, let's go ahead and focus on the four other Guardians in this photo. Nebula, Drax, Mantis, and Groot. Um, Andre, why don't you go ahead and talk first about your thoughts of pick one and go for it, and then we can kind yeah, of focus on the rest I'm of gonna the go. I'm going to go with Nebula first. I, I really liked it, and you kind of saw it a little bit in the holiday special and you can see it here with her throughout the movie having to build up to finally accepting that she is loved by people and that people care about her because she's always been this uh, lone assassin droid or cyborg in the world. And the fact that she's now uh, ha- being part of a community, it's her accepting that these people do care about her, these people love her. This is the first time in her life she's ever had somebody other than maybe Gamora and they're, they're brought they're, everything, even though they sort of cared, they cared for each other. It was all based on them fighting because they had to fight each other. She finally has this acceptance. And by the end of this accepting, I'm going to lead nowhere. I'm going to be the leader of this colony. I'm going, I'm ready to be that person. I'm ready to be Everybody. I, I, I love seeing that in her, in her finding that it's a, I love her little the spot with her uh, on that, uh, oh, whatever, the company. And, or whatever they're talking about, it sounds more like, you said, Gamora says, it sounds more like Nebula, the one he's talking to, and then him turning to her and, like, talking about her black eyes. It was just, I, I love that little bit. There. Cody. It, it, it really felt like Nebula's arc was finding hum- her humanity. In a lot of the ways, and I, that's a lot of what you just said, Andre, and just a, a different take on it, I guess. Um, that she she started out as the cyborg, as you said, and in the Christmas special, she had to kind of um, fi- understand that she was part of the family. And in this one, it almost felt like she had to just finding her role, but also learning how to care and. Rocket was such a large, large part part of that, her relationship with Rocket, which they were the only two of the Guardians that actually didn't get blipped during the Infinity War. And so they created that bond, and I think him being on his potential deathbed throughout the course of this movie 
that she's learning that she truly does care and it's understanding that not just does she care about him but throughout you see her have those moments with mantis those moments with drax those moments with star lord and even with Groot to a certain extent where she has to learn like i really do care about these people and that's where she gets to the end and is like you know what i care about the colony as a whole i care about nowhere i need to stay and take care of this place and her arc from murder machine created by her father to caring, loving nurturer of the guardians has been such a full story makes me want to go back and rewatch and pick up on a lot more of the nuances and the subtle changes as she grew. One of the best things for Nebula for me in this movie, when it comes with Nebula, her constant need to blame everybody else for not being able to be in control of what's going on. That uh, that scene where they're in the ship, in the high evolutionary ship, and it's taking off, and they're trying to save the kids, and she's blaming Drax, and she's blaming Mantis, and Mantis comes back at her, you know, telling her, you're just being mean, you know, you don't need to do this, we're all doing the best we can, we know he's stupid, but you just gotta put up with it, because he is stupid, but it's fine, and Drax just playing that off, and then Mantis being like, forget. <laughs> um... <laughs> That scene was so great, but it's so amazing to see the emotion from Nebula. You guys are talking about her humanity and everything else. For me, it was the emotion. We saw that Nebula was there and feeling emotions for other people. The cyborg feeling emotions. It, her arc in this movie with the new arm created by Rocket that works... By the way, I did love the Tony Stark-esque... Um, Gamora, uh, uh, Nebula in the in the battle with uh, Adam Warlock in the beginning of the movie. Oh, with the... and she rises up with the wings in the arm that has the cannon on it. Mm -hmm. It's the legs bent just like Tony was when he when he would fire with the Iron Man suit. It's such a beautiful, simple thing that James Gunn does there to go ahead and do it. Um, she was an A plus star here. Um. I lost it a little bit with Rocket with moments that made me cry. But the person who made me really just well up and and give give a little bit of tears in the movie theater was Drax. Mm. Drax in this movie made me feel something. Um and for most of the movie he's he it, it's not. Like he om you think he almost dies in Orgo Corp but he doesn't. He just gets blasted from the front and the back and it looks pretty bad. But then you have that scene with the kids where they're trying to get the kids to go away from the starboard wall. And all of a sudden, Drax just starts talking to these children. And he's connecting with them. And they're like, well, why didn't you tell us you could understand them? Nobody asked. <laughs> Nobody thinks to ask me anything. And then he wants to go with Mantis. Because you've seen that connection where I almost think he's fallen in love with her. Like, he hasn't, but it, it almost has that same feeling. Like, he, he can't be away from her. And as he says, well, you need to be protected. And she freaks out at him and says, no, I don't. And Gamora gives him that out. And she's like, no, you were meant to be a father. And I need you here with all of these children. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment that broke me. Because we then get to the dance scene to Katie Turnsdale's song. And he starts dancing. The man who refuses to dance the entirety of all the movies at the very last moment becomes a dancer. I, I gotta correct you, Ed. It's not Katie Turnstall. It was Florence and the Machine song. Is it Florence, Florence and the Machine? Florence oh, Welch. Florence and the Machines. Dog, okay. dog days are over. Yes, that is the song that I was thinking. I apologize. But yes, that moment where he starts dancing, it, it just melted my heart and that's the moment I lost it in the movie theater. That's the, that's the spot I lost. You know, the scene we never, ever got throughout the entirety of this trilogy, and yet we all know, they, they've touched on it, they talked about it, but we never got the scene of Drax losing his family. So at times you forget the fact that he wasn't always Drax the Destroyer. He became the Destroyer because he lost his family. But Thanos is dead. He became the Destroyer to defeat Thanos, 
yet he's still the destroyer to this day. So this is Drax's story of finding who he was, what his purpose is, now that he doesn't have to be the destroyer anymore. And you're right, that scene where, where Nebula tells him, you know, I need you here to be the, the father, or like be a father, you were made to be a dad. It just, it takes you all the way back and you remember, you know, this is a guy who, who lost his only child, who lost his wife, who lost his family. And now he has a colony full of children who need someone to love and care and raise and take care of them. And it was so poetic in a way and just felt like you, you get the Drax. And that's why he felt comfortable to open up and loosen up and dance. Finally, he he couldn't dance before because he didn't have that love and emotion in his heart. All he felt was hate and rage. And now that rage has, has calmed and simmered to the point that he's found his family he found love within the guardians and now he has that love to share with everyone that had to be refugeed onto nowhere yeah it, it, and he, he has and i love how it really shows that drax while he has evolved into he, he gets finally finds his place he's still the same person like not like he like in reality <laughs> he's always the same person he's all like he doesn't like yes it, but because he's just Drax. He's just the most blunt person you'll ever meet. The couch scene on on a counter earth where he's trying to lay down and everybody's getting mad at him for laying on the couch. But he just wants to relax. He just wants to chill. And that even at the end of the movie, he just wants to go protect Mantis. He just wants to do what he what his instinct is. And it's that beauty in the character that we saw him evolve while kind of staying this same at the same time where because he's always been who he is he just has to have a he's just finding a different purpose now but he's still that same lovable person that everybody just it's just the same lovable guy who just wants to be a guy and it's that that couching is the perfect analogy that even when he's still fighting they're still investigating he just wants to lay on a couch it was made to be laid on. It's long yeah. enough for my legs. I should be able to lay on this. Yeah. And then we have Mantis. Um, mm. Andre, you just finished up on Drax, so we'll go ahead with you first for Mantis. I think Mantis was... Because I think her big evolution was the holiday special. She, she, you're creating who the character is in a real backstory, that she actually is one of Ego's children. Is that? And then you bring her here, and then her having to find a purpose and then her bonding with the, I can't remember what they're called now, the big giant. The, the uh, monster from the Guardians 2 opening. The, the yeah. Guardians 2 opening monster. When she's bonding with the three of those and she, and you kind of realize that this girl is so much more powerful than you ever could have realized. She is literally taming monsters with with her abilities. And it's just, I, I love the fact, because again, and she's saying, they won't hurt us, they eat batteries. Meaning that they're 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 yeah, again their primary source it, unless you're attacking them, they're not they're not trying they're not I guess they're not wanting to hunt people because they're, they 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 they're, they want energy and just her being able to finally be and like standing up to Nebula and yelling at her that was like the I think the turning point for her is that she's finally standing up for herself instead of just being made fun of and talked down to as she always was in reality. I love seeing that. And then her at the end saying, no, I'm good. I can protect myself. And then leaves with her monsters because she can protect herself with her monsters. <laughs> Cody. Yeah. It's, it's almost the perfect contrast between Mantis and Drax. And I feel like that's why their stories felt so entwined and intertwined throughout this movie is Drax going from a hardened, vicious, violent killer to finding his emotion and finding his heart. Whereas Mantis has all these emotions. She can understand emotion. She can read emotion. She can control and manipulate emotion. And you see her struggling with her ability and not using it on her teammates to the end with the scene with Drax. You know, at the opening, they ask, why can't you just make Star-Lord forget Gamora? And she's like, well, no, I can't do that to my friends. And at the end... When they're having the conversation about being Drax being stupid and an idiot, then she's just like, forget. And she realizes like she has her powers and can use them for, 
for good, and in that case, it was a good thing. Um, and then finding the the monsters and taming them to be her bodyguards, so that she can go and she becomes more battle hardened. She becomes more confident and capable in herself. You see it even in that battle scene in the hallway of the ship there, fighting through all of the abominations and the monsters on their way to save the children. That she's she's no longer just Ego's assistant. She has become a true guardian, and she can take care and fend for herself. Um, the, the story with Drax and her, you know, calling him stupid and calling him an idiot and being like, but we still love you. It's part of who you are. We don't want you to change that. You're stupid, but we understand you're stupid and we still love you. Part of my thing with Mantis in this movie, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but the way I saw her arc in this movie was she was also the catalyst for arcs for others. In every... <laughs> In seemingly everybody's arc of the in this story, with the exception of Rocket, because Rocket Arts is Rocket's arc is solely Rocket's, um, but in everybody else's arc, she plays a role in in some small way to everybody. Where with Peter, with getting him to go back to Earth, in that scene that we've seen in the clips from before, where you know she's arguing with him, and you 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 miss the beginning of the scene, but you hear people on Earth die when they're fifty. Um, that scene, which we, we've all seen, there's, a, there's a so much earlier in that scene that makes it great, but in that scene, helping nudge Peter to that conclusion. Like we said, the fight with Nebula, where she stands up for herself to show Nebula what Nebula's been doing to others throughout this movie, because Nebula can't control what she can't control. And that makes her angry, and she wants to, to lash out at others. Um... Mantis is the perfect character to help make these changes for everybody. Um, and like Cody said, her and Drax have had this perfectly intertwined story since the moment she was introduced on Ego's Planet in, in the second Guardians movie. Um, Palm did a fantastic job playing this character. Looking back, I don't think you can recast any of these Guardians and do a better job than they did. With any of them. No. No. We get to Groot. Groot had no character arc, unfortunately. Like for, for we cause only because we don't know what Groot says. Like we know what they say based on what Groot says, but really there's no character arc for Alpha Groot in this movie. It really is is his arc is he wants to save arguably his best friend in the world, the person that he's been with for a long time with which is Rocket, mm -hmm. and he wants to and then just evolve and just be part of the team. That's really what he is. And he does evolve. He does have an art of finally talking to him. And saying yeah, I love him. which I hated. Which I, I, I honestly I wasn't I hated. a fan, but I he, he deal didn't with it. actually say it though. It's that we're now five movies into watching Groot. The arc is that we've been watching and adapting the same as Gamora, <laughs> that we reached a point at the end oh of this god. movie where we understood what he said. Oh, oh my did, god, I didn't dude, even think of that. You just blew my mind, Cody. Dude, I didn't even think about that. Cuz they don't oh react cuz they, they don't react like for anything when he says it. They just take it as he's talking. Holy shit. Holy I didn't Cody Hold on, I need a minute. Holy, Holy shit. shit. That makes, All right. that makes All right, so I'll, much more sense. Cody, I, I want you to talk about the villain because the villain of this movie is the perfect villain. And I think there's no... Talk to us about the high evolutionary while me and Andre try to figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> um, you know, it's... He really is the perfect villain to, to manipulate this because... We're seeing the evolution of all of our own characters over the course of the series here. And just the Rocket story arc to tie in the Sovereign arc and how we got Adam Warlock built. The, the villain who wants to create a perfect society. Who has spent his entire life dedicated to trying to make Earth but better. And all of his counter-Earths and his creations and his just obsession with knowledge and learning and creation and invention 
and this the spot at the end where he basically destroys all of his own scientists and underlings but because they start they decide that they don't need him anymore that they've evolved beyond him and he's not willing to accept that anybody else can lead but himself the ultimate the ultimate ego to to you know bring back to guardians 2 he has the ego that he is so much higher than everybody else gods are not real that's why he had to step in yeah the the line. story of his with rocket and we'll we'll dive into it when we actually get to rocket here shortly but they're so perfectly intertwined as somebody who's so obsessed with creating a perfect society whereas somebody who wants to just use their knowledge to create but isn't obsessed with what they're creating um I mean, he was such he was such a great villain. I wanted to punch the screen at, at moments. But there's a there's a fantastic scene, and it's a clip that we've seen. It's it's online. It's readily available. Should you want to watch it? Um, but he's sitting there and he's talking to Peter uh, as Peter's gone to get the code to hopefully save Rocket. And he says Earth would be a pa fabulous place if it weren't for the ignorance and bigotry. And Peter Quill says, "Okay." And it says, it inspired me to create Counter-Earth. And Peter responds with the greatest line I've ever heard. I don't care about all the good. and No, I, no I'm sorry. He says, I don't care. I just want all of the good and none of the bad. And Peter responds with, I don't need another speech by some impotent whack job whose mother didn't love him, rationalizing why he needs to conquer the Earth. And with this perfect timing and pacing... Chuck Woody just looks at Peter and goes, I wasn't trying to conquer the Earth or the universe. I wanted to perfect it. It's the first villain that Marvel's ever had that wasn't trying to conquer the world. That wasn't trying to gain power in terms of being a powerful leader in control. He wanted to make things perfect. I don't think he cares if he's in control as long as perfection had been achieved. But he wanted to be the one to perfect it. That's I, why he wasn't happy with Rocket having the knowledge that he couldn't. He needed to dissect a brain to understand how to do it himself. He couldn't accept the help of someone else. That's why he was so mad when Rocket saw what he didn't see to help him create the the perfect evolution of the creatures on the Counter-Earth that we get to see. Mm -hmm. And Star-Lord has the perfect comeback to that, too, when he says, I just wanted to make it perfect. And he's like, yeah, because a guy with an octopus head selling drugs to a guy with a monkey head is perfect, right? Yeah. And that moment where he's like, yep, yeah, um, we're just going to burn this. And he, the ship starts to take off and he starts blowing up counter earth to start again. It's, he was such the perfect villain and rocket gets involved and rocket finally gets his hands on. And we go back into rocket story and we see that this is what lies beneath at the end In of the movie. Pure this imperfection, what, pure imperfection. This is what lies beneath the high evolutionary. Mm -hmm. because of because of rocket because well, of eight nine p one three well after we saw like i saw his face all stretched back throughout the movie i'm like oh it's a cool it's a cool look to it i just like that's a great visual look to create for this character and then when you saw rocket attack him to get away that's when i went oh that's a mess pulled over his face i thought he was you know like, ended up with the upgrade from what he was doing to upgrade himself. But it was the fact that he had to put Rocket, he had to put a mask on, he had to hide his imperfection with to while he's creating perfection was just absolutely tremendously heartbreaking in a sense. But he was absolutely insane. And the fact like yeah, he doesn't he just wants to take people he doesn't want to like destroy planets, he doesn't want to destroy worlds. He just wants to take from world and create his own of, of, of what his and again it's his version of perfection not what perfect perfection doesn't exist in this world in my opinion in any world but he wants to create what he thinks perfection is and it's just 
heavily trended. Like I, I remember watching this guy in Peacemaker, and I loved him in there. Like Doctor Cody, tremendous on that show, and I loved it so much when he was revealed as a revolutionary. I like I'm gonna kill it in this, and he did such a perfect job that he's the best villain. I honestly think since Robert Redford's character in Winter Soldier to me, or Thanos, or guess Thanos, Thanos is pretty damn good, but like, like, like for a not Thanos level villain facing the entirety of the Avengers, I think he's up there. Cause I think the only other guy that touched him was Robert Redford's character in Winter Soldier. It's that the way they they emote, the way they act, the way they're just the passion that comes out of them. I, the only person I would uh, I would counter with is Killmonger. I would counter that the same Killmonger. Thing. I would counter yeah. that Killmonger was until this point. You you have Killmonger, you have Thanos, and you have Robert Redford as like these great key villains mm-hmm. in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think, um, dependent on his legal situation, Jonathan Majors will continue to be one of those key villains. We're going hmm. to leave the Jonathan Major situation for a little while. Um, that we can talk about on another episode of Marvel Talk, where we yes. might... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cody, your, th- your thoughts on the High Evolutionary? I, I already gave mine. We need yours, okay. Ed. Oh, yeah. my th- um, I-, I agree. I think he was... Sorry, I'm getting off track trying to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. Um, no, I think he was fantastic. I think he was the epitome of everything he needed to be. He gave the movie in, in, in a few scenes because most of his scenes aren't in this time. All of these scenes that we really see him in are in the past. There's mm-hmm. very little of him in current time. And I think it's amazing how much anger and villainy that you can get into in strictly flashbacks. Well, and it, it tracks him going from when he first creates Rocket and then getting worse and worse and worse throughout Rocket's arc. And then the, it shows us who we have now. And this is the worst of them all in the way he treats the uh, Adam Warlock people. And that, you just realize how much worse this guy's gotten if you think about that spot before. Yeah. I, I think Eric Voss said it best when... Oh. Yeah. Throughout the movie, you see him losing his mind and losing control of his sanity over the fact that his imperfect creation was his perfect creation. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of the imperfect creation, 8-9-P-3-1. P-1-3. Rocket Rack. P-1-3. P-1-3. Uh, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Um, Rocket Raccoon. Cody, <laughs> you're going to have the undaunting task of Picking some of these things with Rocket, and we'll kind of loop back around to each other as we go. But let's talk about Rocket and the amazing work he did in this movie. It, thank you, Hill, you Kevin. Put thank it, you for joining us. How can Sorry. you even put it into words, really? Like, it was just, it was so much. And so much of the flashbacks and the the scenes between Rocket and the other experiments, Lila, Teeth's Floor... The every time they were on the screen, you just you felt like your heart was breaking for them almost like these poor animals in in their situations and just trying to make the best of a horrible situation, um, trying to continue to stay positive and look up and you know be on the bright side and enjoying what they had built through their cage bars with each other. Um, you know, Bradley Cooper and, and I forget the name of the child that played or voiced the younger version of Rocket, but between the two of them, they just, they brought so much emotion and so much passion to the role. The voice work from the other three creatures as well, it just, it really fleshed it all out and made, made you feel like you've known these characters for a lot more than the 20, 25 minutes of, of screen time they got in this film. Um the arc of of rocket and understanding you know how he came to be why he has such an obsession with machinery why he was so smart and and ultimately just the realization that rocket has been the true protagonist of the series all along 
Yeah, New Rock Stars has put out numerous videos. If you've watched the Deep Dive series, Eric Voss has been going into. There's a quote from James Gunn who says that the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, it seems like you're following the story of Peter Quill. But in actuality, the hidden secret protagonist of the entire series is Rocket. That Rocket is the person who the entire series is built around. And Peter just happens to be the eyes in which we look through the, mo the movie at. And I think that's an amazing way to have done what James Gunn did here. Um, Rocket is so great. And nothing more heartbreaking than they've gotten, they've dealt with, you know, trying to get past all the bad guys. And they're going to save the children. And Rocket's searching the ship, looking for the animals. And he finds the cage that seems to have housed him all those years ago. And he sees that those creatures are indeed North American raccoons. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, he calls himself Rocket Raccoon for the first time. To it's, me, that was almost as passionate and as emotionally stirring and jarring as the Avengers Assemble from Endgame. Yeah, I was I was gonna relate it to I am Iron Man from the from Endgame as well. Yep. that moment where where Tony Stark goes, "I am Iron Man," when Rocket Raccoon says, "I am Rocket, Rocket Raccoon." It's that moment that everything comes full circle. His entire story. The reason why he refuses to have friends with the exception of of Groot because of the pain from the last time he had friends to the joy he has of going through the galaxy with his friends, cutting back again to the line where they talk about the sky and how he names himself Rocket to fly off into the sky with all of his friends. It's mm -hmm. it is so heartbreaking in this movie to watch those flashbacks and James Gunn does such a fantastic job with being just graphic enough to stir everything inside you without going too far yeah um, I, I I find him act like it, it's a whole thing and I it, what makes me think most of with all this rock and his friends and wanting to fly off with his friends makes me think about there's a thing if it's the first one or second one him and quill are just taking the controls back and forth from each other that makes that scene feel so much more to me because he wants to he wants to be the one flying his friends in the sky and now that makes you realize it's so much more and almost like oh uh, that's why he wants to fly the ship that's why he wants to be in control of the ship it made me go oh it's it was like a beautiful moment but like it was pretty freaking Okay. It was also a metaphor for them fighting over who's the protagonist, right? Mm -hmm. You know, them going back and forth, like, I'm the captain. No, I'm the captain. No, I'm the captain. Who, who's the protagonist here? The one we think it is or the one who really is? What about yeah. Infinity War? Where we have the argument over who the captain is when Thor assumes that Rocket is the captain. Yeah. <laughs> that another yeah. moment of, of literally them spelling out to us that Rocket's the protagonist in this movie by <laughs> Thor literally calling out Rocket as the captain. And all of us thinking that it's just Thor being Thor. And it's just <laughs> Thor being smarter than all of us the entire time. And, yeah. and again, the fact that it's, it's Rocket and Nebula, the two that actually survived the blip. The two that ended up leading this at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It, it makes so much more sense as you look back at things and to realize that, yeah, he survived. He was a leader. He became, I, I think Rocket truly became a leader probably during that point. Like he became the person that he is now in that point of losing his friends, realizing what he lost. And it's like really kind of, I think, evolving in that sense. And then having the near death to really have to step up to do it. I think it all kind of warps into one, make him really want to be that leader. Because even if you look, if you look at you nowhere know, at the beginning, Rock's walking around. Will's just drunk net, and Nebula is just in kind of realized it's Nebula and Rocket running things here, and and so it just and it, it that what you see there. It is I love the evolution of him realizing finally realizing that yes, he is a raccoon, and just all the beautiful moments him 
making friends and them everybody picking their names together. And I love Floor so much because she's just like the floor, and then she just picks it because it's the floor, and it's just it, it was all those weird little stupid things that just make his heart break so much more like that he lost everybody and then like Lila dying and then the other two getting shot after was just like I was sitting with one of my buddies from work and we're both like grabbing on each other going no we're both just like so like I was so mad I wanted to punch the goddamn screen and the the near death scene when we get to revisit right where you know, you have Lila there telling him that they're the sky is beautiful and they're flying together, and um, you know, just the silhouettes of Keefs and Floor in the background, and um, Rocket so happy to see his friends again and wanting to go with them, and she's like, "Like you can join us, but not yet. Your your story's not done yet." All right, so to relate this a little bit to wrestling because we're all wrestling fans. Did anyone believe the near fall? Because I know I fell for it just a little bit. I fell for that near fall when he almost died. Me too. And Peter's I... screaming and cry- like screaming no, and we think he's dying. I I believe the near fall on Drax more. Okay. I, I, I well, but the, because Drax survived, I thought because I thought Drax was going to be the one that perished when he got shot, and then he's alive, and I'm like okay. And then I, I, I fell for it because I was thinking, like, there's no way we're getting out of this without a death. In, in the way I was thinking in my head. And I'm like, they're going to fucking kill Rocket. They're going to fucking kill Rocket. God damn it. And then they didn't. And I'm just like, oh, thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you, Chris. Because I was just, I was so invested in Rocket at that point. And it was just like, I'm like, oh, I, I it, 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 it got me. It got me. Yeah, the 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 Drax near fall in Orgo Corp, and the Peter near fall at the end had me a lot more than Rocket. This just felt like Rocket's story all along. That afterlife interaction between him and Lila felt way too much like Harry and Dumbledore at the end mm-hmm. of the Harry Potter movies. Um, it definitely didn't have me there anywhere close. It was that- after I walked into the theater that I realize oh they pulled a harry and dumbledore after i walked out i'm like oh that's the fucking is they caught me with it how did they like and i love those movies i'm like i don't know how they got me i've seen that movie how many goddamn times and they got me with it i was so mad it almost reminded me of deadpool 2 with vanessa and uh with deadpool and vanessa where yeah. she's constantly telling him it's he's, that, it, that he's not ready that it's not his time right now mm-hmm. um but no it was fantastic and again there's so much more to go over this this movie was fantastic we haven't touched on Orgo Corp. We really don't have time. This was one of the funniest things. But again, the, there's so much greatness in that. Just go ahead and enjoy it. Nathan Fillion being in another movie. This is his second, at least his second. I think he's been in all three Guardians movies as a voiceover character. And this is his first time being on screen as Nathan Fillion, essentially. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, do we think the High Evolutionary is dead? Yes or no? I really, I, I, I hope so, in a sense, because again, his art came to an end. We don't need him. We don't need that again. We don't need a return of the High Evolutionary. I don't know what you could do with him in a return, but the fact that Rocket spared him at the end leaves definitely open ended. That if they decide they have a reason to bring him back, he yeah. could have been on an escape pod off the ship or something. No. Mm-hmm. So the movie ends with Peter going back home and seeing his grandfather. And that was a beautiful, touching thing. Um, you know, he gets there and he thinks he's at the wrong place because somebody unexpected answers the door and she leads him out back and Peter and his grandfather instantly recognize each other. And it's this wonderful re- uh, re- uh, homecoming. It's the, eyes. it's the eyes. He sees yeah. his daughter's eyes. That's what it is. <laughs> he has his mother's eyes, right? So... Yeah. It's because the, the his ego says it that he has his mother's eyes, and that's that's where he looks up and like it's a different person, but he sees the eyes and he realizes, oh, this is Peter. And I was I was uh, absolutely like, oh, I, 
and again, he's finally going to find that fulfillment that he was—he was—he was finding with the Guardians before Gamora died. He'll find—I think he finds it again here. He finds that hole that he had since childhood is finally being filled. Yeah. Learn how to swim. Oh, Cody was cutting out a little bit there. I didn't hear you. Want to try that again? I said he—he's learned. He needs to learn to swim. Stop jumping from lily pad to lily pad. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get two. We're gonna finish off the show uh, for now with two quick post-credit scenes, and we get the new Guardians of the Galaxy, as I'm calling them. We have Kraglin, we have Adam Warlock, we have Blurp, we have um, Philavel, we have Alpha Groot down here. I couldn't get a good picture of it, but we do have Cosmo the Space Dog in this photo as well. The new Guardians of the Galaxy, focusing in on Philavel, who has. The eyes that glow, and she can make light from her hand. Uh, I was talking to Andre about this pre-show. Do we feel like this is going to be another link to the Marvels? Potentially. Yeah. Well, again, if you look at her comic history, yes, she was a daughter of Marvel. So, I think eventually, I don't like. I think it'll. It won't be. I don't think it'll be in the movie The Marvels. I don't think she'll have anything to do with that. Maybe a post-credit scene what i'm thinking where where you'll get maybe hers you won't be in the movie proper itself but yes her powers are 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 similar to them so i would love to see the interaction there and to see the marvels and then like i would love to see a free large rocket again you need to like make some comment at him like uh, at marvel just for that little play there i would love to see that what did you guys think of the new guardians lineup that we see potentially going forward whenever the Avengers might need the help of the Guardians. We see this new Guardians lineup. Cody? Um, I mean, I enjoy all the characters involved. Uh, it felt like a nice way to close the story. I, I don't know that this is a crew that I would really be behind for a future movie incarnation. Um, I feel like Warlock has a lot to be told still. I feel like Phyla could have her own kind of story with the the marvels rocket and groot obviously can have something there craglin and cosmo i think are the weak link here um i enjoyed their story in this it was some nice comedic relief it was fun um the fact that they managed to fit cosmo's story in as the dog that was sent up by the russian astronauts um and craglin you know the moment that he had that we didn't even touch on the moment with the the arrow where he finally understood that it's not about the whistle it's about feeling it in your heart and manages to to save nowhere almost single-handedly um it, it was it was a nice kind of side story to divert from all of the really really heavy stuff we were dealing with with the rest of the guardians mm-hmm. um andre your thoughts on the new guardians I look forward if if they're gonna do something with it, great. I I, I will go. I will see it again. It's gonna. It, the one thing about Guardians is it's always been lighthearted. So whatever goes forward, it, you know, it's gonna be lighthearted in a sense, while also having some tragic story to it. But I, I'd want to see. I would like to see Adam Warlock get his own thing. Maybe it's a Disney Plus show. Maybe it's his own movie. I don't know. But I'd like to see him do something on his own and to learn who and like him develop into who he should ultimately become and the same with for the bell I, I yeah her history with with captain marvel and all that stuff i think needs to be shown and i hope we get it at some point i think that they're fine enough i i don't desperately like cody i don't desperately want to see them in anything but i mm. i'll be happy to see them when they pop up in something else yeah whether it, it be it, kang dynasty whether it be secret wars whether they pop up in a Thor movie in the future or something else. I'm fine with what we get, but I'm not I'm not going to be like, oh, the new Guardians, I have to go see that. F- I, I, I've said that I I've gone and seen every movie, whether I like I'm really hyped for it or not. I'll go if they come up with Guardians Volume Four or whatever it's gonna be, I'll go see it. Like I'm no I'm I know I'm not, I'm no I can't say now, well I don't know if I go see it. I know I would. Because I, I'm just a homer to go see Marvel movies in the I don't want to be spoiled. It's just who I am. But is, am I? Is it what I want in the future? No. Like I'm, I, I'll be good if you're just add-ins for other movies. I'll be honest. 
as opposed to a Guardians movie with this crew of Guardians, I would much rather see a Marvel property more like more likely than not a Disney Plus show following the Ravagers. That would be great. I would I would thoroughly love that. We have a lot there's a lot of story left to tell with that. In our second uh post credit scene, it's a very simple scene with Peter talking to his grandfather, talking about the uh forty five year old adult who lives next door who doesn't want to cut the grass for his mother so that Peter has to go over and do it and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And now Peter's irritated. But I I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the small detail in this scene, which is the newspaper, which I'm sure all of us noticed. The St. Charles Post, where it has a story about the alien abduction where Kevin Bacon is doing a tell-all in a small paper in in Missouri. Um, where Kevin Bacon shares all about his alien abduction. Um, I, I love how it all ties together, and James Gunn never seems to leave very much undone in terms of it. Um, the biggest question coming out of that is the last thing that we see in the movie. The legendary Star-Lord will return. Um, do we think this means the actual Star-Lord character, or is there going to be another character that takes on the moniker of Star-Lord? Personally, I think the what it is, for me personally, I think it's, it will be whatever he does next with uh, Avengers, I think is what it's leading to, is I think he's going to He's on Earth now, where all the rest of the Avengers are. He'll get summoned by Wong and to come join up with the team to do whatever needs to be done in Secret Wars or in Kang Dynasty. That's where I think this that, that Legend of Star Lord will return. I think that's what it's for. It's for Secret Wars or Kang Dynasty. Yeah, I think Secret Wars makes the most sense. He's on Earth now. We're leading up to this. I think that Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord, will have a role in the Secret Wars. I agree. I wholeheartedly think it is just as simple as it sounds that Secret Wars is going to probably bring back everybody and anybody who's possibly there because if we thought Endgame was a big one, uh, the Secret Wars storyline in the comics is massive and overarching and will bring in multiple Earths. I'm very excited to see what comes from that. Uh, Lastly, just because... Captain Britain. Yeah. Um... (laughs) Before we get out of here, I do want to. We're going to touch on one thing after this, but I want to go ahead and, as Ole has been comfort, uh, kind enough to give us this time, I'm going to go ahead and let everybody know what you can see coming up this week on Ole. And then we're going to go ahead and talk about the one and only James Gunn and thank him for everything he's given us. <laughs> said we are going to go ahead and just talk about for a a few moments we talked about him a little bit earlier he is leaving us to go ahead and run the dceu he is the co-head of creative at uh dc comic dc movies i believe is the official title james gunn the writer and director of the guardians series um an absolute fantastic creative mind who has given us three of the most heartwarming movies in the entire MCU. Uh, Andre, go ahead and give us your thoughts on his legacy, what you're excited to see of him in DC going forward, and do you see any chance that he returns in the future? Uh, For return, 
there, it's 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 never it's never out of the realm. There's always that shot he comes back and does something. There, you can never say never. We we're, we're professional wrestling fans. We know you can never say never about anything. Um, do I think it's likely? No, but I can't say it won't happen. Um, I, depends, and again, he, he's about to go run an entire movie franchise that I really, really, really do hope he succeeds with. Um, and we won't see any of that until at least 2025 because it's going to take a while to get all the But like, what he's done for Marvel, I think it's called Chu. Chu. I, I can't say Guardians Two was my was one of the best stories I've seen in Marvel. But out of from one and three, I think he's told two of the best stories that we've seen on screen in in the MCU. And it, it just how he built the character, how he built the emotion that you've gotten from all these characters is just absolutely amazing. And I, 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 I wish we were getting more from him directly right now. I really do. But I look forward to seeing what <laughs> next with DC. And I want to see what, like, especially with the Peacemaker side of it all, you know he's going to be directly involved in that stuff. So I, I, I'm, I look forward to the future. I'm going to get back into DC with what he's coming out with. Mr. Cody. Yeah, I'll definitely give him the opportunity. Um, I feel like what he's brought to to Marvel has been a lot of very deep storytelling, the ability to blend the emotion and the heartfelt and the heartwarming with the lightheartedness and the excuse me, the humor, the the joy and the fun of it that he makes you feel your emotions when he, you need to feel emotion, but he can also make you smile and laugh and put in like a really fun jab or a fun joke or a nice little um, Easter egg for you to pick up and, and recognize like it's not always going to be serious. And the the DCEU as it's been to this point has just felt like it needs to stay on that serious, that it's it doesn't buy into the lightheartedness. It doesn't buy into the fun of the superhero that it, all of these DC heroes between your, your Batmans, your Supermans, your, even the Flash, um, feel like they just have to be something more than they are. Like Aquaman and Wonder Woman even. There wasn't a ton of fun and joy and, and humor in that. You know, they, they tried to sell a little bit with the Wonder Woman films of like the neon and the bright colors and the music. But it still felt like it was trying to take itself too seriously. And... I know a lot of the DC characters tend to lean that way even in their comic arcs. So I'm really interested to see how James Gunn can handle these characters who maybe don't have that lightheartedness to them to make us want to see them and feel more for them. Because um, other than the, the Adam West Batman, I can't think of a DC property that's really had a lighthearted, fun side to it. Smallville to a point. But that's about it. <laughs> James Gunn took the took the helm of the biggest risk in the MCU in the early days of the MCU. Mm -hmm. When when Marvel Entertainment decided to do this whole thing, they had a list of B level characters that they didn't know what they were going to be less and below, and they have made them some of the biggest superheroes in the world. They took a chance, New Line dropped the ball, and they got Iron Man. And from then on, it just seemed like everything kept clicking. And I've been watching a series, it's a four-part series that goes through the backstage and the on-screen of the MCU as a complete retrospective. And the idea of the Guardians of the Galaxy working was such an insane idea before. To the point where the marketing for the movie was marketing around the actors in the movie and, and saying who they were as actors first, characters second. Like, on the poster, you have, you know, Chris Pratt as the headline and then, at, you know, as Star-Lord. And you have all these people as the character that they are. And in the second movie, you see that the marketing has changed. 
And now we know who these people are and we love these people because of the work James Gunn did in the first movie to tell us that we needed to love these people. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's a shame that James Gunn is leaving to do something else for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It is an entirely great thing for the DCEU that this man is at the helm. Hopefully he's learned from Kevin Feige about knowing a direction and running with it. And keeping things on a straight line. And knowing where you're going in the future before you get there. Um... I'm excited for what comes in the DCEU and I'm hoping that someday soon we can have another director in the MCU who can be as good as James Gunn, who can be as good as the Russos because we now don't have any with the exception of Taika Waititi. We have Taika Waititi um, to the Ant-Man series. You, you have Peyton Reed. But a lot of these directors are hired to do a movie and leave. Um, I don't know if Chloe Zhao is coming back for Eternals 2. She's supposed to. Okay. Um, I know the guy who did Shang-Chi is coming back for Shang-Chi 2. I know he is also, if I remember correctly, he is the one who is uh, working with the same writer who did Shang-Chi to do the Kang Dynasty, if I remember correctly. I believe so. So, I think so, yeah. You know, hopefully we're getting into this next run of directors who can do the things that James Gunn has done. But again, a big thank you to the man James Gunn. A big thank you to Kevin Feige for giving us movies that make us feel. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, when you go to the movies, you just want to feel something. Whether it's lighthearted comedy, whether it's just a way to see two hours, two and a half hours, and forget about your troubles. Or to get heartfelt into characters who make you feel everything and anything. And it's remarkable. And as wrestling fans, this is what wrestling does to us. And that's why I love movies and wrestling. Because I think there's so much interconnected with making you feel something. Mm -hmm. As the catalyst for what we love. The, the one thing we haven't discussed about James Gunn going from Marvel to take on the mantle at DC now... And it would be a massive undertaking and would require a lot of logistical negotiation. But could we potentially be in a, a universe right now where James Gunn and Kevin Feige can work together to have a Marvel and DC crossover? It's potential. We do know that the DC characters are canon in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Superman does exist. And we know that from the Eternals. Superman is directly <coughs> referenced in the Eternals. Um, there's been a couple other times where we've had other other DC characters referenced. Um, but mm -hmm. yes, I would love to potentially see someday, maybe, something along those lines. You know, Disney made it work with, with Sony for the Spider-Man rights and the crossover. It's never out of the realm of possibility that Disney and... Uh, I don't even know who owns DC right now, but uh, Warner Brothers. Warner is it Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers. That they could, they could find a way to work together to make a multi-billion-dollar franchise. And with that said, thank you for joining us for Guardians of the Galaxy. But before you leave too soon, I want to go ahead and let everybody talk about what they're up to and what they've got going on soon. So we're going to go ahead and start with that Canada dude. Oh, me? Okay, I thought we were going to start with Cody. But, yeah, you can find me on uh, uh, on Twitter, Hive, and Mastodon at that Canada guy, Instagram at that Canada dude, on Facebook at Andre and Melball Wrestling Talk, where you can also find me on YouTube, me and Mel putting out all of our content covering Japanese professional wrestling and the local independent wrestling scene. You can check us out there on YouTube.com slash at Andre and Melball Wrestling Talk. We have uh, new episodes coming out this week covering Wrestling Don Taku and the April 29th ep, uh, event from Stardom will come out. Will come our reviews of those will be coming out this week. So please check those out, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah, Mr. Cody. I'm simple. You can find me on Twitter at Cody Defoe right there. Um, talking wrestling sharing whenever i'm going live on something usually i'm on most thursdays on making an impact 
doing a breakdown and recap of Thursday night's Impact Wrestling shows, potentially also on their weekends when they're doing their uh, premier live events uh, with Astrid, sometimes with Ed. I am not on there this coming week. Unfortunately, a conflict in plans and a scheduling change at the last minute has put me off the show for this week, but... Astrid will be there. She will have a special guest on with her this week. Tune in this Thursday and find out who she's bringing in. Yes. And, of course, you can find me on Twitter at EdFries12584. You can find me here on the Olay Networks uh, with all the wonderful stuff at Olay Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram, at twitch.com, uh, twitch.tv slash Our Local Establishment, on YouTube at Our Local Establishment. Um, you can find me every Tuesday with the aforementioned Astrid Bizarro as one of the busiest people in the world that she does uh, taking over with me every Tuesday night as we talk all things NXT. Um, you can also find me every Saturday um, with Chris Parrish. We are doing Wrestle Draft where we are going through uh, a few seasons of GM mode until one of us enters the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. So right now we have done one episode, the sorry, two episodes. We have done everything up to the first premium live event. The premium live event that was supposed to be live this Saturday at uh, 1 o'clock will unfortunately not be a live show. It'll be a pre-recorded show as scheduling conflicts have made it that we cannot do that show live. But it will be on the Twitch every Saturday at 1 o'clock. And then it will be on the YouTube the following Wednesday at noontime. It'll drop. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, yep. Sorry. I got distracted by something. Thank you for joining us, everybody, and we will see you next time for, potentially, the next time we will see you will be the start of Secret Invasion. Yeah, unless, that would be it. Unless we do something in between, and Andre and I there will might, let you know. There might be something a little special. We don't know. We don't know, but we will talk to you soon. Until then, enjoy Marvel. Marvel. <laughs>